Play Moon's Lightbringer presents The Mythical Astronomy of Ice and Fire The Blood of the Other, Part 2 The Star That Brings the Dawn Hey there, friends, patrons, and fellow mythical astronomers. Yes, that new theme music is still thrilling, isn't it? It's LML here, and boy, do I have a good episode for you today. Actually, it's going to be another one of those double features where I release two episodes about three days apart, simply because it seems more fun to do it that way than to release one gigantic two-and-a-half-hour or even three-hour episode. The overarching topic throughout both of these episodes will be the stolen other baby, of course, who becomes the progenitor of House Stark, according to our theory. And specifically, we're going to focus on the last hero aspect of this archetype. So, if you've ever wanted more Stark in your mythical astronomy, you're in luck. If you're tantalized by the hints of an ancient connection between Stark and Dane, these episodes are for you. In fact... This first one in particular is going to be a Stark Dane Last Hero Sandwich, and doesn't that sound appealing? I'm also going to hit you with some brand new sources of inspiration for A Song of Ice and Fire that we haven't covered before in Mythical Astronomy, at least not in any detail. Those sources would be none other than Michael Moorcock's Elric of Milnibony, and some specific parts of J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings and The Silmarillion. As you will quickly see, Martin drew on the fiction of these two authors pretty heavily when he fashioned certain elements of A Song of Ice and Fire, like The Last Hero, The Sword of the Morning and House Dane, Valerian Steel, Valeria and the Great Empire of the Dawn, and House Stark. In this episode, we'll explore these influences, and we'll rip into all the connections that House Dane and House Stark have to The Last Hero, connections which center around our stolen other baby archetype. In the next episode, we'll dive back into the Song of Ice and Fire text for some close analysis of the great characters who play this archetype, mostly from House Dane and Stark, but also from a lesser-known Westerosi house known as House Seaworth. Davos's scenes at the Wolf's Den in White Harbor in A Dance with Dragons are some of my very favorite chapters, and we'll be diving into the unbelievable symbolism locked away inside those black stone walls of this ancient fortress of the First Men. A week after the second episode, which will be Saturday, April 7th, we'll have our Q&A live stream at 3 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, which is 12 noon Pacific Time and 8 p.m. London Time. That's a half hour earlier than our usual time slot, so take note and come join the fun. Even better, send in your questions and comments beforehand via WordPress, YouTube, Twitter, or Patreon, and then come to the live stream to hear me discuss your fabulous insights with the masses. As my guest this time, I am pleased to have Robert from the In Deep Geek YouTube channel. He's one of my favorite analysts of A Song of Ice and Fire because he really has a knack for making theories that are both exciting and well thought out, and that's a great combination. He has excellent videos about the Winterfell Crypts, the Horn of Winter, and even Kyburn, and of course many other topics, so be sure to check out the In Deep Geek YouTube channel. Robert will also be lending us his vocal acting talents for the next two episodes, so you'll get to enjoy his delightful British accent reading the text quotes, and to me, fantasy simply sounds better when read in a British accent, especially with a voice as good as Robert's. So thanks to him, and thanks to the Amethyst Koala for performing the female voices, thanks to Stanley Black for our great intro music, and to John Walsh of the John Walsh Guitar YouTube channel for our great flamenco guitar music. Thanks to George R.R. R. Martin for giving us so much to talk about, and thanks above all to our Patreon sponsors for their undying generosity and support. Now it begins. Stormbringer, Shadow Chaser. This section is brought to you by three of our Guardian of the Galaxy patrons Lady Diana, the Ghost Huntress, Pursuer of Truth, and Guardian of the King's Crown and the Cradle. Sir Harrison of House Casterly, the Noontide Sun and Guardian of the Shadow Cat, and Manami of the Jade Sea, the Merry Deviant, Keeper of the Winter Roses and Guardian of the Celestial Ghost. 
Just when you thought you weren't able to abide any more bards or baleful name games, they abate. The balishness and bardishness abates, anyway, but not the name games. That's right. Exit Bale and enter Eldric Shadow Chaser, because one of the other possible names for our frozen ice dragon baby is indeed Eldric Shadow Chaser. And what a name it is! In the world of ice and fire, five names are given for the flaming sword hero who is said to have fought the darkness and ended the long night. Azor Ahai, Yin Tar, Nefarion, Hercoon the Hero, and Eldric Shadow Chaser. Yintar, Nefarian, and Hercoon all have names that match place names in eastern Essos, Nefer, Yiti, and the former empire of Hercoon, and can therefore be traced to those nations. Azor High's legend comes from Ashai, and my theory about the Great Empire of the Dawn also places his origins there, but then we have Eldric Shadow Chaser, a name without an obvious origin aside from it being a reference to Elric of Melnibony, the hero of a fantasy series by one Michael Moorcock. George has confirmed that he was inspired by Moorcock's Elric. See if you can spot any clues in this description of Elric from Elric of Melnibony from 1972. It is the colour of a bleached skull, his flesh, and the long hair which flows below his shoulders is milk-white. From the tapering, beautiful head stare two slanting eyes, crimson and moody, and from the loose sleeves of his yellow gown emerge two slender hands, also the colour of bone. Sound like someone you know? It's Bloodraven, essentially, complete with bleached skull, milk-white hair, and crimson eyes. Bone-white hands are something we find on the others, interestingly, and of course, the white bark of the weirwood is always described as bone white. That's pretty good. Blood Raven is clearly, clearly fashioned from the impression that Elric of Melnibony left on George's mind. But as always, it gets worse. Elric of Melnibony is a genuine, bona fide magic sword hero, and his magic sword is a black one called Stormbringer. Hmm. This Stormbringer swallows the souls of those it slays, and basically brings doom to everything it touches, and to everything beloved of the one who wields it. Only a Song of Ice and Fire side, we know that Lightbringer, seriously, Lightbringer, Stormbringer, is said to be a soul-drinking sword as well, since the legend states that Lightbringer drank Nissa Nissa's soul when it slew her. And as you must surely have noticed, I've spent the last three years or so proposing that Lightbringer was actually a Dark Lightbringer, or a Nightbringer a black sword, and a prototype to Valerian steel, in other words. And in regards to the idea of Stormbringer bringing doom and destruction to everyone who wields it, you'll surely recall my theory about how the forging of Lightbringer cracked the moon and in some way represents the cause of the Long Night. Plus, right there in the myth itself, we have Lightbringer beginning its existence by demanding the life and blood and soul of Nissa Nissa, which fits the idea of a cursed sword. Thematically, Elric struggles with alienation, very like the Hamlet slash Calervo mythical figure who seems to have inspired Moorcock. This theme is certainly present with Bloodraven's story, and it's a similar alienation born out of possessing extraordinary knowledge and power, and the responsibility that comes with those things. In other words, Bloodraven and the basic myth of Lightbringer takes obvious inspiration from Elric of Milnibony. And if my theories about Dark Lightbringer, Azor High, and the Long Night are close to the mark, then you can see that Martin was actually drawing from Moorcock's ideas even more than it appeared at first. The point of pointing all this out, besides it being cool and interesting, is to show you that it makes perfect sense for George to pull these elements of Moorcock's Elric into the Azor High mythology, as he does by naming Elric Shadow Chaser as one of the five known epithets of the Flaming Sword hero. Learning the basics about Elric of Melnibony helps us understand part of the context from which Azor Ahai was fashioned. And you have to admit that it's a big point in favor of the Dark Lightbringer theory and the Azor Ahai caused the Long Night theory. As a matter of fact, one of the other of the five names that the World of Ice and Fire gives for the Flaming Sword hero, Hercoon the Hero, is also an Elric of Melnibony reference. In Moorcock's world, Elric's cousin and heir is named Irkun, and that's Y-Y-R-K-O-O-N instead of H-Y-R-K-O-O-N. So it's one letter away from Hercoon the hero. And interestingly, Elric's cousin Irkun turns out to be something of a rival and enemy, as well as the heir. 
Now, to me, adding the name of Elric's cousin and heir to the Azor Ahai name list seems like a clue for us to think about multiple Azor Ahai heroes that may descend from one another or be related to one another in some way, and who may have fought one another. And this is something that we've been discussing for a long time, especially in the Baleful Bard episode, where we picked up on a ton of stories about people warring with brothers, sons, grandsons, fathers, and grandfathers. Multiple Azor Ahai figures that are related to one another to me, is really the only way to explain the fact that so many of the main characters show a combination of Azor Ahai, Last Hero, and Night's King symbolism, and the fact that each generation often seems to repeat the symbolism of their parents. So put simply, Martin is literally folding two enemy cousins, Elric and Irkun, into one flaming sword hero monomyth. And I think this can only be a clue that the Azor Ahai title may in fact apply to more than one person just as we think that the Azor Ahai Reborn title applies to at least John and Daenerys, and who knows how many others. <laughs> Along the same lines, we find that Elric of Milnibony has two other cousins of note. There's Divim Tivar, one of the dragon masters who can speak to dragons, and fights alongside Elric with another black sword, this one called Mournblade, and that's M-O-U-R-N, Mournblade. So yeah... It's a black sword of the morning, guys. Eat it up. And it's right next to Stormbringer. Elric's other cousin is a woman named Cimmeril, whom Elric hopes to marry and make his queen. John will be marrying his aunt, potentially, and Bloodraven was in love with his half-sister, so you can sort of see the echoes there. Oh, and I suppose I'd be neglectful if I didn't mention a couple of the titles of some of the short stories that comprise the Elric saga. There's The Flamebringers, the Black Sword's Brothers, The Bane of the Black Sword, and The Weird of the White Wolf. I kid you not. Now, I will just say one more time that when John is resurrected, I think there's a good chance that he'll have milk-white hair and possibly crimson eyes, like his weirwood-colored White Wolf, like Blood Raven, and like Elric of Milnibony. John already has the Black Sword and a sense of doom, plus a weird White Wolf, so... There you go. I sometimes get crap about not making enough predictions, so I've been trying to point them out when I make them lately. I hereby officially predict that John will be Elric of Melnibony when he awakens, and he might even bring a storm with him. A snowstorm, naturally. Now that we've taken our crash course on Moorcox Elric, we understand the Eldric part of the Eldric Shadow Chaser name. As for the Shadow Chaser part, well, on a very basic descriptive level, Shadow Chaser makes a lot of sense as a moniker for someone who fought with fire and light to end the darkness and shadow of the Long Night. He's chasing the shadows away, very straightforward. Presumably, he would have fought the White Shadows, known as the Others, so the Shadow Chaser epithet works even better as he is literally chasing shadows at that point. The Eastern legends of the Flaming Sword hero speak of the demons of the Lion of Night ravaging the land during the Long Night also, and that might amount to a similar sort of shadow chasing that needed to be done out in the East. But as I was saying earlier, the weird thing is that unlike the other four names which are given for the Flaming Sword hero, the name Eldric doesn't have any linguistic matches to any names or words from Essos. It does, however, find a bunch of echoes in Westeros, namely in the houses of Stark and Dane, the two houses with strong ties to the last hero, who is the closest thing to a Westerosi version of Azor Ahai. With all that comes with the Eldric name, can this really be a coincidence? Stark and Dane? Yeah, probably not. As it happens, taking a quick glance at the Eldric-derived names of Westeros reveals much. Much and more, as they say. Down in the crypts of Winterfell, we find a legendary King of Winter known as King Edric Snowbeard Stark. That's got to be one of the best nicknames in the whole series, and he certainly sounds like a guy who might have an affinity with ice magic. Or more specifically, his name sounds like a clue to us readers about a Stark ancestor with an affinity for ice magic. The same goes for the name of his great-grandson, Brandon Ice Eyes Stark. I have to say, the first men may not have had writing, but they sure had a knack for picking a great nickname. Now, in more recent history, there's also a non-snow-bearded Edric Stark. Presumably, his beard is more standard and made of hair, as well as an Elric Stark, who is Ned's great-great-great-grandfather. Aha! 
Elric of Winterfell Nibony. <laughs> Bad jokes aside, with two Edrics and one Elric in the Stark family that we've heard of, we have to wonder whether Eldric Shadow Chaser might be an ancestor of the Starks. And this would, of course, make sense if Eldric Shadow Chaser was a name for the last hero and or the stolen other baby. Eldric and its variants could be a family name dating all the way back to the Long Night, just as the name Brandon appears to be. Consider this. In the back of the world of Ice and Fire, George gave us a recent family tree for House Stark, which goes back about two centuries. And within that short time, we find Elric Stark and the non-snowbearded Edric Stark. If we have two Eldric variants in recent history, and at least one more in ancient history, Edric Snowbeard, of course, it really seems like it could be a Stark family name that dates back at least to the time of King Edric Snowbeard, and perhaps before. Just for context, in that same ten-generation family tree, we find seven Brandon variants, and I'm including one Branda, four Benjens and one Benedict, and one or two predecessors for Sansa, Arya, Rickon, and Lyanna. We also find lots of variants of the same name, Kriegard and Cregan, Arya and Ara, Lyanna and Lanara and Liara and Lysara and Lysa, and so on and so forth. Thus, Elric and Edric make sense as derivatives of Eldric. Down at Starfall, meanwhile, we find more echoes of the Eldric Shadow Chaser name. For example, we hear of the legendary swordsman Ulric Dane, Ulric, Elric, Eldric, who was the Sword of the Morning in Daemon Blackfire's time. The quote about this from the Sworn Sword even pits Blackfire versus Dawn in a hypothetical sword match. When Prince Daemon had Blackfire in his hand, there was not a man to equal him. Not Ulric Dane with Dawn, no, nor even the Dragon Knight with Dark Sister. That's quite the trio, isn't it? As I mentioned last time, there is a decent chance that we could see Darkstar wielding Dawn in the Kingsguard of Fagon Blackfire, a.k.a. Young Griff, who may have had the Targaryen family sword Blackfire delivered to him by Illyrio. So... We may yet see these two fabled swords in the same room together, Blackfire and Dawn. Expect there to be mythical astronomy. Predictions aside, and yes, there is another prediction, angry guy on the YouTube comments. Once again, we have to say that it makes sense to see an Elric variant, Ulric Dane, wielding a magic sword. A sword which may have once been the original ice of House Stark. I don't know about you, but... I'm basically sold on that idea. The symbolic match between the Wall and Dawn is just too overwhelming, especially in the light of all the other evidence that we've looked at. Anyway, that stuff is in Moons of Ice and Fire 2, Dawn of the Others, if you want to brush up on that. Better still, the current young Lord of Starfall, the next Dane in line to have a shot at being named Sword of the Morning, is young Edric Dane, who is in turn named for a Stark, our beloved Eddard. Edric's nickname is Ned. That's right, Edric is a Dane named after a Stark. Ned Dane has previously been viewed as a curious clue about the Tower of Joy, one which raises the question of why the Danes would name a child after Ned, who is said to have slain Arthur Dane in single combat. But now it's kind of a bonkers clue. This is a big confirmation that the Eldric Shadow Chaser thing is in fact an archetype one which is tied to the Danes and the Starks. In other words, not only does the Eldric name find all these echoes in both House Dane and House Stark, the one that we have alive today, Edric Dane, is tied to both houses, being a Dane named for a Stark. Another takeaway here is that the Danes apparently consider Edric a variant of Eddard, which kind of opens up a different can of worms, it means that we're going to have to have a look at the Ned as another echo of this figure. We'll actually have to save that for a future episode in order to take the appropriate time and energy for Ned and Winterfell, which kind of go together. Plus, it's always good to have something to look forward to. In any case, thinking of Eddard as an Eldric variant causes us to notice that the recent Stark family tree also has an Edwile, an Edwin, and a fellow that goes by the uber-fantasy-sounding name Edirian Stark, the Bridegroom. If those names can be counted as part of the Edric, Eldric, Elric family of names, then this is easy to spot as a Stark name. A Stark name which they apparently loan to the Danes, or something. 
the great empire of the day. This section is brought to you by three of our Guardian of the Galaxy patrons. Memo Sign, the poem on two feet, mother of muses, rider of the dragon saga, and guardian of the swan. Nienna the Wise, the Persa Phoenix, guardian of the Ice Dragon, and most fittingly, Sir Imriel Jourdain of the Tour, spinner of the Great Wheel, and guardian of the Sword of the Morning. I said at the beginning that both the Starks and Danes are connected to the last hero mythology, and this is basically the point of all the Eldric names being found in House Stark and House Dane. We are going to take a more in-depth look at the various Eldric characters of Stark and Dane, particularly Ned Dane, plus we'll check out a couple of other folks who fit the pattern. But first, I'd like to talk about how the last hero mythology is firmly rooted in the houses of Stark and Dane. It's a pretty fun topic, so I assume you guys are okay with that. This will give us the appropriate context needed to analyze the Eldric figures of Stark and Dane. And yes, we'll get Edric Storm too, don't worry. Plus, I have some pretty tasty new Last Hero-related mythology, which is going to knock your socks off. We'll start with House Dane, beginning with their origins. It's no secret that people in the fandom have been looking at House Dane, their glowing magical meteor sword named Dawn, and the Sword of the Morning title for many years now, and thinking that surely this must have something to do with Lightbringer. It's apparent pretty early on that the legend of Azor Ahai and Lightbringer, which comes from the region of Ashai and E.T., far to the east, is somehow important to the Westerosi story, and that's only become more obvious over time. Therefore, it seems clear to us readers that the Azor Ahai story has to intersect with Westeros somehow, and House Dane, this weird family with occasionally purple eyes and silver hair, who just happened to own a magic glowing sword named after Sunrise, would seem to be the likely suspect. They kind of stick out like a sore thumb, in fact. As some of you know, even before The World of Ice and Fire ever came out, some in the fandom had already speculated about the Danes having some distant common ancestor with Valeria, including one Elio Garcia, who, along with his wife Linda Antonsen, both created Westeros.org and co-wrote The World of Ice and Fire with George Martin. And since I got my start on Westeros.org writing essays, I have to tip my cap and say thanks, guys. And you were on to something. So then the World of Ice and Fire came out and gave us the Great Empire of the Dawn and the Bloodstone Emperor and all the rest. As Aziz and I laid out in our video series about the Great Empire of the Dawn, which you can find on my YouTube channel or the History of Westeros YouTube channel, the evidence strongly points to the Great Empire of the Dawn as that common ancestor of both Valyria and House Dane. According to our theory, these would be the people who built a shy the Dawn Age Dragonlords from the East that have been rumored since Danny's very first chapters of A Game of Thrones. It seems very possible that House Dane was founded by the child of Azor Ahai and Nissa Nissa, who may or may not be the same person as the Amethyst Empress, the last rightful ruler of the Great Empire of the Dawn, who seems to have had silver hair and purple eyes, the trademark Dragonlord features. And speaking more generally, the Danes would seem to represent a merging of this ancient, pre-Valerian blood of the dragon and the blood of the first men, which seems to be part of the formula for making a last hero, someone like, oh, say, Jon Snow. Essentially, the Great Empire of the Dawn theory shows a plausible and even probable mechanism by which the Danes may have come to Westeros from the Far East, perhaps even from Ashai itself, which I believe to have been the former capital of the Great Empire of the Dawn. Then, also in the world of Ice and Fire, George gave us a name for the flaming sword hero, Eldric Shadow Chaser, which matches a couple of members of House Dane, and this only added more fuel to the fire for those who see Dawn as Lightbringer and or the Dragonsteel of the last hero. Now most of you reading this will already be familiar with the Great Empire of the Dawn theory, but today I have a special treat for you. I'm going to show you an entirely new line of evidence to support the House Dane descends from the Great Empire of the Dawn theory. And we'll do that by opening up a portal into Middle-earth. Meaning, we're going to draw upon the Lord of the Rings knowledge of my good friend Blue Tiger, who, by the way, translates mythical astronomy of ice and fire into Polish, which is an impressive feat. Now, if you follow me on Twitter, at the Dragon LML, then you have probably seen some of Blue Tiger's Lord of the Rings A Song of Ice and Fire commentary, and the correlations between House Dane and Tolkien's Dunedain are some of the most striking. 
And by the way, Blue Tiger is at Lord Blue Tiger on Twitter. Now, I think I can do this without diving too deep into Middle Earth, which is a very deep can of worms, let me tell you. And I'll also give a hat tip to my good friend, Joe Magician, who contributed to the following information as well. And if you haven't checked out Joe Magician's YouTube channel titled Joe Magician, you definitely should. He put a new video up just recently. All right, so it all starts with Atlantis. Atlantis is one of the coolest myths in all of world mythology, and it's irresistible to fantasy authors. Both J.R.R. and G.R.R. have created their own versions of Atlantis. George's is, for the most part, the great empire of the Dawn and ancient Ashai, although there's also a whiff of Atlantis mythology around the doom of Valyria, though Valyria correlates more strongly to Rome and Nazi Germany, I would say. In Tolkien's universe, Atlantis is called Numenor, although there's also a whiff of Atlantis mythology in the Sinking of Beleriand story as well. Now, in both cases, the likeness to Atlantis is very striking. Numenor is a lost golden land, specifically an island, which sunk beneath the sea after mankind became too proud and sinful, with the survivors emigrating to the remaining dry land, which is Middle-earth, and then founding new kingdoms. In fact, the survivors founding new kingdoms with the remnants of the lost knowledge idea is a major component of the Atlantis myth, even though the flood and land subsidence gets more attention. Many world cultures actually have a myth of a lost golden land that sunk beneath the waves, with their survivors often becoming the first sages or kings of new civilizations such as Egypt or the Mesopotamian civilizations of Sumer, Akkad, and Assyria, and we even find similar myths in North and South America. This is the context in which we should read the quote from The World of Ice and Fire about the possibility of people from the Shadowlands by a shy teaching the Valerians to tame dragons before vanishing from history. The same goes for the idea of pre-Valerian dragon lords coming to Westeros to build that few stone fortress on Battle Isle, or, of course, to found House Dane. As a matter of fact, the world book flat out says that the survivors of the Long Night in the former lands of the Great Empire of the Dawn essentially splintered apart and scattered, and we can see the first kingdoms that sprang up in its wake. Hirakun, Yi Ti, Nefer, Leng, the clans of the Jogos Nai, and there's even evidence that refugees from the Great Empire made it over the Bones Mountains, giving their bloodlines to the Dothraki and the Sarnori, and I suspect to the Quathai, who built Karth as well. They may have also made it to a little old place called Westeros. After all, that few stone fortress, which seems to predate the Long Night, essentially proves they were there. And how Stane kind of stares at you with those purple eyes glimmering in the light of their magic sword and says, Come on, man, this isn't a hard one. So, back over in Tolkien land, which is called Arda, by the way, the human survivors of the fallen Atlantis-like Numenor are called the Dunedain. Dunedain. Dane. That's right. The Dunedain are the men who founded Gondor and Arnor, the main human kingdoms that we see in Lord of the Rings. Minas Tirith, if you recall, is the capital of Gondor. So before the Dunedain came to Numenor, they were actually called the Edain, which is the plural form of Adan, which means men, in Kenya, Tolkien's made-up elf language. When those Dunedain fled Numenor and came to Middle-earth, they built some stuff. One thing they built was Orthanc, the Tower of Isengard, which you may remember from the Lord of the Rings as Saruman's Tower. Tens of thousands. That's the one at which Gandalf is held captive and then rescued by the eagles, and later Orthanc is surrounded by tree ants from Fangorn Forest and flooded. The notable thing about Orthanc being built by the Dunedain is that... It seemed a thing not made by the craft of men, but riven from the bones of the earth in the ancient torment of the hills. A peak and isle of rock it was, black and gleaming hard. Four mighty piers of many-sided stone were welded into one. In other words, it sounds a lot like fused black stone, such as we find at Battle Isle. Dunedain, coming to a new land and building a fused black stone tower, sounds a lot like the Danes and their potential fellow refugees from the Great Empire of the Dawn, the High Towers, building the fused Blackstone Fortress at Battle Isle, which would become the base of the High Tower. Orthanc and the High Tower also compare well, because atop Orthanc, Saruman sits in isolation, watching the world through the Palantir Stone and saying tens of thousands over and over again. And atop the High Tower, from which you can supposedly see clear to the wall, 
You find Lord Leighton Hightower has been up there for ten years, ruling the city from the clouds. And now he's up there with his daughter Melora, the Mad Maid, consulting a book of spells. Final note on Orthanc. After Aragorn triumphs and takes the throne of Gondor as King Elisar, he gives Orthanc and the surrounding area back over to the Tree Ents, and they grow a new forest and call it the Tree Garth of Orthanc. And here you can see that the trap prison implication of Garth is being played upon, as well as the enclosed garden meaning of the word Garth. The leader of the Dúnedain when they fled from sinking Númenor was Elendil, whose two famous sons were Isildur and Anarion. Now, you don't have to be steeped in Tolkien lore like Blue Tiger or Joe Magician to recognize the names Elendil and Isildur, because they're in Lord of the Rings. That's right, Aragorn, the rightful king of Gondor, is called Isildur's heir, and the famous sword that Elrond of Rivendell reforges for Aragorn is called the Sword of Elendil. Its actual name is Narsil, and Narsil is where this correlation really heats up. Narsil means red and white flame in Kenya. A sword of red and white flame that belongs to the Dunedain, huh? Yes, it sounds familiar, since Dawn is a white sword, and Lightbringer is said to have burned red. For what it's worth, Elendil translates to star lover, while Isildur translates to devoted to the moon. My kind of folks. It gets better because, as you may recall, Narsil was originally wielded by Elendil against Sauron, who slew Elendil and broke Narsil. His son Isildur then picked up the broken sword and cut the one ring from Sauron's hand, which destroys Sauron's corporeal form and allows Isildur to claim the ring. That's right, a broken sword. Just like the last hero, and just like all the broken sword symbolism surrounding Azor Ahai and last hero figures. Now, I don't know if Dawn was ever broken. Dawn is known to break, after all, just about every day. Or if Dawn was ever reforged. But we do see Ned's ice split in two. Perhaps most importantly, the tale of the last hero has his first sword breaking from the cold, and then later he shows up with dragon steel, implying that he either got a new sword or reforged his old one. As Bowen Marsh says to John in A Dance with Dragons, a broken sword can be reforged. A broken sword can still kill. Ask Sauron. Martin even gives a nod to the Isildur story in the form of the tale of Gendel and Gorn, and this is from A Clash of Kings. Gorn, said John. Gorn was king beyond the wall. Aye, said Agreet. Together with his brother Gendel, three thousand years ago, they led a host of free folk through the caves, and the watch was none the wiser. But when they came out, the wolves of Winterfell fell upon them. There was a battle, John recalled. Gorn slew the king in the north, but his son picked up his banner and took the crown from his head and cut down Gorn in turn. It's notable that the one playing the Isildur role here is a Stark and the king in the north, and that this story is being told to Jon Snow, the special dragonglass snowflake. So, with all that said, you can surely see the overall correlations which are stacking up. The Dúnedain came from fallen Númenor, bringing with them a magic sword of red and white flame. In the New Land, this magic sword was broken in a final battle against a Dark Lord, but was still used to win the battle. House Dane, on the other hand, may have been founded by the survivors of the fallen Great Empire of the Dawn, who may have brought with them a magic white sword, which may have the ability to catch on fire. A Dane may have become the last hero, whose sword was broken in a final battle against the Great Enemy either the others or Night's King himself, and yet that sword was either reforged or replaced, and still used to win the battle. The correlations continue into the present-day story of both universes, as, thousands of years later, a descendant of the Dúnedain, Aragorn, wields Narsil once again while leading the armies of mankind against the great evil. And in A Song of Ice and Fire, we find that our two primary manifestations of Azor Ahai Reborn, who seem destined to fight the others, Daenerys Targaryen and Jon Snow, have Dane blood coursing through their veins. It's even possible that Jon could get his hands on Dawn, as we've talked about before. There's another layer to the story of the Idain and Numenor, which George is drawing from as well, because before the Idain came to the island of Numenor, they actually lived in kingdoms in the lost land of Beleriand, where most of the events of the Silmarillion take place. And Beleriand actually adjoins the current lands of Middle-earth, just to the west of the current coastline. 
The Edain are essentially the kingdoms of men who stayed loyal to the elves and did not worship Morgoth, who is Sauron's evil predecessor, and who fought alongside the elves against Morgoth during the Great Wars. Even though the elves and the Edain were victorious, the violence was so great that most of Beleriand sunk beneath the sea, and it was actually the slaying of a huge dragon and Caligon that caused the land to sink. In any case, the Valar, the gods essentially, rewarded the Edain for their loyalty and raised the island of Numenor from the sea, far to the west. Numenor was also called Westerness, or Elena, which means starwards. Numenor is actually shaped like a five-pointed star, with Mount Menel Tarma, pillar of heaven, in the middle. Tolkien conceived of his tales as having existed sort of in the ancient past of Earth, or like an alternate history of planet Earth, and so he based the map on Earth's map, placing Middle Earth approximately in line with Europe, and he placed Numenor in the Atlantic Ocean, where Atlantis was supposed to have existed. Another quick side note, you may have noticed the word Valar, the name of Tolkien's Middle Earth gods. I mean, Valar Targaryen, and Valar Margulis. And oh, by the way, Morgulis comes from Minas Morgul, the city of the Ringwraiths. Minas Morgul used to be called Minas Ithil, the city of the moon, before it was corrupted, and now it radiates a pale corpse light, which is a phrase we recognize as one borrowed by George R. R. Martin. So, Valar Margulis, translated into Tolkien language, actually means the gods of the corrupted, corpse-like moon city. How do you like that? I would call this one of several Tolkienic ideas which may have inspired Martin's idea about a corrupted and fallen moon. So here come the heavy parallels to House Dane. To find Numenor, the Edain, led by Irindil, the same guy who slew the dragon and Caligon, sailed westwards following Venus, which Tolkien calls the Star of Irindil. If they followed a Venus analog star westward, that means it would have been in its even star position when it appears to fall from the heavens at sunset and sink into the horizon. Hmm, that sounds familiar. Like the Danes, they followed a falling star to reach their new homeland which was in the shape of a star. I think it's very possible that this is the sense in which the Danes followed a falling star to find their new land to the west. It might simply be a fancy way to say they sailed west and they like Venus. Now, as you can see, the overall morning star symbolism of the Edain turned Dunedain and their star-shaped island of Numenor is rather overwhelming. And that's before we start reading off some of the kings of Numenor. There's Tar Anarion, which means Son of the Sun, and that's another name for the Morning Star. Then we've got Tar Menildur, Servant of Heavens. There's Queen Tar and Calame, Radiance, or the Most Bright, and King Tar and Calamon, the Most Bright. There's Tar and Dukal, Lord of Light, really, and he was a usurper, by the way. There's Tar Kalmasil, Sword of Light, or Light Sword. Yes, that's right. Then there's Ar Gimilzor, the Star Flame. Hello, Samuel Starfire Dane. And Ar Farazan Tar Kalion. And Farazan means the Golden, and Kalion means Son of Light. The first king of Numenor was Elros, the half elven son of Irindil himself, and brother of Elrond, who became the master of Rivendell. Elrond, Elros, Elric, just saying. Blue Tiger also made a bullet point list of all the specific correlations between Numenor and the Great Empire of the Dawn, so check this out. The first rulers lived for centuries, then the average lifespan declines. They grow wicked and rebel against the gods. A woman is supposed to inherit the throne, but an ambitious family member usurps the throne and forces her to marry him. That's the Amethyst Empress, who was usurped by her brother the Bloodstone Emperor in A Song of Ice and Fire, and then in Tolkien land, we have Queen Tarmiriel, who was usurped by her cousin, Arpharazan the Golden, who caused the downfall of Numenor and therefore equates very well to the Bloodstone Emperor. The usurped queen has a name connected with gemstones. Miriel means jewel daughter and then the Amethyst Empress, and has silver hair associations too. The Great Empire of the Dawn emperors seem to have silver hair. And then Tarmiriel, turns out, was named after the elf queen Miriel, the uniquely silver-haired mother of Fenor, who might be the most Azor high like of anyone in the Silmarillion, by the way, being a smith whose spirit was so fiery that his corpse self-combusted upon death. 
Finor was also the one who made the Palantiri, the seeing stones, such as possessed by Saruman in the Lord of the Rings. The Geodonians and Numenorians turn evil, and their king becomes a necromancer, although the Bloodstone Emperor figure in Numenor is actually played by two people, Arpharazon and Sauron, with Sauron the necromancer ruling through Arpharazon. A great cataclysm wiped out their civilizations, but some faithful survived, which would be Elendil and the Dúnedain, or the Danes and Hightowers, and then some evildoers also survived, which would be the Valerians, perhaps Azor High or Men of the Shadowlands. So thanks once again to Blue Tiger for digging up these correlations, and also to Joe Magician. And one day, if you're lucky, I'll sit down with Blue Tiger and do a whole episode on Lord of the Rings, A Song of Ice and Fire correlations, because... We're only scraping the surface here, let me tell you. So let me know how interested you guys are in something like that, and maybe it'll light a fire under our asses to get it happening. In any case, I've included this info here not only as a way to add evidence to the Danes come from the Great Empire of the Dawn theory, but also to show that House Dane has even more connections to the last hero and his sword of dragonsteel than would first appear. And what I mean by that is this. The Danes, along with their neighbors, the Hightowers, sure seem a lot like George's version of the Dúnedain, with both Dane and Dúnedain being heavily, heavily based on Venus mythology. And what else is based on Venus-related ideas? Well, the last hero and Lightbringer, of course. And in turn, the symbolism of both the last hero and House Dane sure seems to draw a lot from the famous magic sword of the leader of the Dúnedain, Narsil, the sword of red and white flame which was broken and reforged. All of this is quite suggestive of a Dane last hero, with Dawn as his sword of dragonsteel, which may have also been remembered as Lightbringer, or perhaps some sort of twist or inversion of that scenario. Now, setting the Lord of the Rings angle aside, we were, of course, already well familiar with the Morningstar symbolism of House Dane, Dawn, and the Sword of the Morning title. It's always been apparent that that kind of symbolism could be read as applying to the ending of the Long Night, and it's very similar to the language of the Night's Watch Oaths, being the sword in the darkness and the light that brings the dawn. It's interesting because the sword of the morning is dawn, which is a white sword, while the Night's Watch wear black and pronounce themselves as the swords in the darkness. And of course, their ideal weapons are also black, either dragon glass or valyrian steel. Yet despite the color difference, the symbolism of the Night's Watch and everything related to the sword of the morning and dawn are virtually identical. And that's because the Night's Watch symbolism also flows from Venus mythology, of course. And if you're foggy on that, check out Bloodstone Compendium 6, Lucifer Means Lightbringer, one of my underrated episodes, if I do say so myself. With all the Morning Star symbolism shared by Dawn, the Sword of the Morning, the Night's Watch, and Lightbringer, it really would make a ton of sense if Dawn is the dragon steel of the last hero story. And that's why that's always been a popular theory in the fandom. That's right, long before I made the connection that thousands of dragons coming from a cracked moon were probably meteor dragons, some clever people somewhere had already put together the idea that any sword made from a meteor could be considered dragonsteel in a very real sense. Another thing that's made this theory popular is the idea that a meteorite can contain a ready-made steel alloy, that is, iron which contains a bit of nickel or phosphorus, and this would begin to explain the presence of an anachronistic advanced sword in ancient pre andal invasion Westeros. Now, I know I've proposed that Dawn was the original ice of House Stark, and I do believe that to be the case. But that doesn't necessarily mean it came from the North originally, only that it was used by a Stark hero of old, and that it somehow started the tradition of Starks naming their swords ice. It certainly may have come from the North, and we're going to talk about that more in a minute, But the other credible origin theory about Dawn is, of course, that it came from the Great Empire of the Dawn, in the hands of the first Dane settlers, which would, of course, fit the correlation with the Dúnedain bringing Narsil with them when they fled Númenor. As my friend Dern Durndin first noticed, a glowing white sword like Dawn is a potential match for the Swords of Pale Fire, held in the hands of the Gemstone Emperors in Danny's Wake the Dragon Dream in A Game of Thrones. The Great Empire of the Dawn was supposedly a very advanced civilization, and in control of dragons for at least some part of their history, so they provide a logical answer to the question of who would have been able to forge a sword like Dawn, which the maesters describe as being like white valerian steel. 
It's also possible they didn't bring Dawn with them from their former homeland, but simply the metallurgical and magical knowledge needed to forge it, which they may have then done in Westeros. Now, if Dawn's origins do lie with the great empire of the Dawn, then perhaps it was only used the one time by a Stark when he was in dire need of help against the others. Think of Arthur Dane at the Tower of Joy as loaning the sword to Ned. <laughs> a better correlation might actually lie in the future, if circumstances lead to John borrowing Dawn from House Dane somehow for the final battle. Like I said, John does have some ancient Dane blood, passed down from Egg's mother, Diana Dane, so maybe it won't even be a loan, but it would still kind of read that way. The Danes as keepers of Dawn, who give it to the Starks when dire need arises. I also want to mention that there is a decent bit of evidence that the Dragonlord settlers from the Great Empire of the Dawn, who built the fused stone fortress on Battle Isle, had communication with the Children of the Forest. It may have even been the point of coming to Westeros. So, perhaps the Children somehow facilitated a transfer of Dawn to the last hero after he broke his first sword. Perhaps that was part of the help which the Children gave the last hero in the Night's Watch. Perhaps they gave the men of the watch dragon glass, and they gave their leader milk glass. Well, there you go. When our hypothetical Stark last hero was done with the big white sword, perhaps he returned it to the Danes, as Ned, who was an Eldric figure, remember, returned Dawn to Starfall after the Tower of Joy. After the battle was won and the sword returned, perhaps the Starks simply started a tradition of calling their swords ice, in remembrance of the big white glowing sword that could withstand the cold. Now, as much as I like that theory, and as neat and tidy as it seems, I mean, Dawn, great empire of the Dawn, right? There is a strong case to be made that Dawn's origins do indeed lie in the north, and that it does indeed possess a more tangible connection to ice magic and the others and the ancient Starks. This will lead us into the Stark connections to the last hero mythology, so it's time for a witty new section title, and also time to read the names of some beloved Patreon sponsors. The Sword of Morning. This section is brought to you by the Sacred Order of the Black Hand, Sir Dale the Winged Fist, the last scion of House Mud and captain of the dread ship Black Squirrel, Sir Stoyles of the Long Branch, seeker of Pale Blood, Mallory Sand, Storm Witch, rider of Zulfric the Black Beast, Matthias Mormont, the sea goat of the bottomless depths, Count Magpie the Rude, the Dinky Giant, Hornblower of the Oslo Fjord, the Lady of Stellar Reason and Maleficence, and Lord Brandon Brewer of Castle Blackroom, sworn alesmith to House Stark, Grand Maester of the Zithomancer's Guild, and Keeper of the Buzz. A northern origin for Dawn scenario would still have Dawn as the dragon steel of the last hero, but it would imply Dawn as being something more like ice dragon steel, which would fit the symbolism we've seen so far. We spent the first couple of Moons of Ice and Fire episodes talking a lot about Dawn's symbolic status as an icy sword, and about how the curtain of light which guards the heart of winter is actually the Aurora Borealis, which translates to Dawn of the North. But there's actually a very logical argument for dragon steel being a sword of northern origin that lies in the details of the last hero legend. Consider the sword component of the last hero story. So as cold and death filled the earth, the last hero determined to seek out the children in the hopes that their ancient magics could win back what the armies of men had lost. He set out into the dead lands with a sword, a horse, a dog, and a dozen companions. For years he searched, until he despaired of ever finding the children of the forest in their secret cities. One by one his friends died, and his horse, and finally even his dog, and his sword froze so hard the blade snapped when he tried to use it, and the others smelled the hot blood in him, and came silent on his trail, stalking him with packs of pale white spiders big as hounds. So the last hero goes north into the dead lands to seek out the children, and eventually his first sword breaks from the cold while he's fleeing the others. As for what happens next, both Old Nan and the Maester say that the last hero received some kind of help from the children of the forest, and then he shows up at the final battle with his sword of dragon steel, slaying the others, chasing the shadows, and bringing the dawn. 
Point being, kind of seems like he gets his new Dragonsteel sword in the north, right? He's already in the north when his sword breaks, and then he gets help from the children, whom he went north to find. Ergo, he must have acquired his Dragonsteel in the north. And if Dawn is the original ice of House Stark, and perhaps even associated with ice magic in some way, well, you can see how this starts to come together. Perhaps the Dawn story is only partly right. Perhaps Dawn was made from a white meteor, but one which fell not at Starfall, but in the heart of winter, or somewhere else in the far north. Perhaps Dawn was even forged at Winterfell, who knows? Maybe Ned dipping ice into the cold black pond is actually a reenactment of our heroic Stark tempering a newly forged sword in icy water. We can speculate all day, but the point is that Dragonsteel seems to come from the north, Dragonsteel might be Dawn, and Dawn might have been the original ice. An alternate scenario which sort of blends the two origin possibilities for Dawn together would be the last hero sitting out with a sword brought over from the Great Empire of the Dawn, with that sword breaking and then being reforged in the north. Perhaps our icy Stark child, stolen from the others, used his ice magic abilities to do some sort of cold forging process involving burning cold blue starfire. That's probably a little too fun and high fantasy of an idea. One can dream, though, and if Dawn does have some connection to ice magic, well, that has to happen somehow. Now, as for the Starks and their connections to the last hero, it begins with obvious narrative sense. The Starks are essentially the protagonist of the story, the home team, if you will. It seems counterintuitive in the extreme to think that the last hero wasn't tied to the Starks in some meaningful way. Bran and John are generally regarded as the two people who seem like modern-day incarnations of the last hero archetype, and I would agree. And as Brendan Beefish and poor Quentin discussed recently on their new not a cast podcast, which everyone should listen to if they don't already, the primary duty of the Stark in Winterfell is set out in their oft-repeated house words, Winter is coming, and reinforced by the slogan of the collective North, The North Remembers. There is always to be a Stark in Winterfell, and he must always remember that Winter is coming, capital W and capital C. And of course we're talking about the others here. It's the same role that the Night's Watch and the Last Hero play, defending the realm of the living against the others. And of course the Starks are closely tied to the Watch as well. All of this points towards a Stark Last Hero. If the icy origins of House Stark theory that we began to lay out in the last episode is true, then the Starks would descend from Azor Ahai's child by Night's Queen. As we've seen, the Last Hero seems to be either this rescued Night's King baby or the one who rescues the baby, and either scenario places the Starks right in the thick of things. Old Nan suggests that Night's King himself was a Stark, and although my theory tortures that a bit by saying that Night's King was actually a frozen dragon lord whose stolen baby became a Stark, I still consider Night's King a Stark, at least in a sense. Alternately, if it was Azor Ahai's child with Nissa Nissa who went on to become Night's King, a scenario which I'm a pretty big fan of, that person may have had a normal child before giving his seed to Night's Queen, with that normal child perhaps founding House Dane, and the rescued Night's King baby founding the Winterfell Starks. A scenario like this would make the houses of Stark and Dane something like cousins or long-lost brothers, which would fit the symbolism that we've seen so far. And hey, if you like anagrams, shout out to my Twitter crew, you can cut the words Dane and Stark in half and swap them around, and get Dark Stain, such as the Dark Stain that was left on Azor Ahai's honor when he slew his wife and broke the moon, or the Dark Stain that was left upon the entire planet in the form of those dark clouds that blotted out the sun. Even better wordplay may be found by chopping the ends off of both words, which leaves Daystar, a name for Venus. Eldric Shadowchaser is the Dane Stark and the Daystar, if you will. The Danes have dawn which could be the original ice. And the Starks have a magic sword, too, which is the most recent sword to be called ice. Smoke Dark Ice, with its dark glow, is the most thematically central Valyrian steel sword in the books. And with the possible exception of Dawn, ice is the most important Lightbringer symbol of any sword in the book, as I've written about extensively. Although ice is actually very dark gray, it can be considered a black sword because it was carried by a lord of Winterfell named Barthagen Stark, who was known as Barth Blacksword. And of course, Barth Blacksword is the brother of Elric Stark. Thus, 
Ice can be thought of as black ice, and this is a symbol which, in my opinion, also refers to dragon glass, which is black frozen fire. Both forms of black ice, valerian steel and dragon glass, kill the others. And of course, that's something we talked about in the Moons of Ice and Fire series, so I hope you're all familiar with that. A couple of episodes ago, we even looked at the Sir Barristan chapter in A Dance with Dragons that follows immediately after John's death scene, and that's a chapter which opens with a black dawn. Then I made a wordplay sandwich about how if dawn is like white valerian steel, then a valerian steel sword is also like a black dawn sword, which again makes thematic sense, as black dawns are what we would have had during the long night when the smoke darkened the skies. And, of course, Valyrian steel is in turn often described as smoke dark. I mentioned that if Dawn is the original ice of House Stark, then it's like a white ice counterpoint to Ned's current black ice. And that puts us in mind of the observation we made a minute ago about the identical Venus-based symbolism of the Sword of the Morning and the Night's Watch, despite one being associated with white swords and the other with black swords. As you may recall... We've been given several direct suggestions that the Sword of the Morning can be a black sword, and always in a Stark-centric context. Both John and Rob have scenes where their swords run with morning light. Rob is sitting enthroned as the king in the north when it happens to him, complete with sword across his lap and direwolf at his side, and John has it happen twice in the chapter when he executes Jano Slint, in a perfect imitation of his true father, Ned Stark, executing Garrod at the opening of the story. John also has that cool scene at the wall with the Sword of the Morning constellation, which is loaded with symbolism and seems to tie John personally to the idea of the Sword of the Morning. The only other time a sword runs with morning light is when Joffrey holds up Widow's Whale at the Purple Wedding. But of course, Widow's Whale is simply one half of Ned's ice. So this brings us right back to the Starks owning a black Sword of the Morning. There was also some last hero math in that scene, if you recall, with a dozen names being shouted out before someone said, Widow's Whale, and gained Joffrey's approval. Joffrey even swung Widow's Whale dangerously near a king's guard, forcing him to jump back. It was actually Balin Swan, which is just perfect. A Baelish other with the yin-yang symbolism of the House Swan sigil is essentially a Night's King figure, post-icy transformation, and therefore just the sort of person you'd want to attack with a black Stark sword running with morning light. So, on three of the four occasions that a Stark sword runs with morning light, it is a black Valyrian steel sword. The one time it wasn't Valyrian steel was when Rob sat enthroned as the king in the north, but in that very scene, he was in fact demanding the return of Ned's ice. The stone kings of winter that Rob is imitating also have iron long swords placed across their lap, And because iron is black, we can see that even these Stark statues wield black swords. That is, at least until they rust away and leave a red stain, implying a red sword. And I hopefully don't even have to remind you that Ned's ice is now made into two swords that are red and black. So I think this is pretty consistent. Red and black swords for the King of Winter symbolism here. Rob was also wearing a replica of the old crown of the Kings of Winter in that scene, which is an open circlet of hammered bronze incised with the runes of the first men, surmounted by nine black iron spikes wrought in the shape of long swords. A bronze crescent moon with nine black swords. That's excellent mythical astronomy, since black swords come from moon death, and on a more basic level, I think this pretty much clinches the black sword associations of the Starks. They name their people after black swords, their crown has black swords... They use black swords. They're associated with the Night's Watch, who are black swords. I think you get the point. And yet, the Starks are the only ones whose swords run with morning light. So what's going on here? A black sword of the morning? A black dawn sword? Well, as I've pointed out, wearing morning clothes, M-O-U-R-N, morning, means wearing black, which Cersei says makes one look half a corpse. Therefore, the Night's Watch, the swords in the darkness who wear black and use black weapons, and whose original members may have been half-dead green zombies, can be seen as black swords of mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, instead of the white sword of the morning that we all know and love. 
George Martin may have gotten this idea from the cousin of Elric of Melnibony, Divim Tavar, the Dragon Master, who wielded that black sword called Mornblade. The spelling even emphasizes mourning with a U, which I'm sure Moorcock did because it was a black sword. It's similar to naming a sword Widow's Wail or Orphan Maker. You're naming the sword after the wailing and mourning of your foes and their agonized loved ones. Think about the idea of the Starks and mourning with a U. You may recall that the signature Stark look is a long and melancholy face, and that this look is even matched by the heart tree in the Winterfell Godswood, which is also described as having a long and melancholy face. It's kind of a theme for House Stark. They are melancholy and have lots of reasons to mourn, basically every time a Stark goes south of the neck. My friend and collaborator, Ravenous Reader, has further connected this idea to the Sorrowful Men, the Assassin's Guild who tried to kill Daenerys in Carth with a manticore, as well as to Azor High himself, who was sorrowful before he slew Nissa Nissa, according to legend. It says, Great was his woe, and great was his sorrow then, for he knew what he must do. And if you think about it, both Ned and John's arcs have them repeatedly being forced to do things that they do not want to do, and feeling anguished about it. I don't want to go on and on, but the point is that the idea of Starks as black swords of mourning, with a U, does indeed fit the theme of their house and its main figures. I would say that Martin is making a bit of a comment on the idea that sometimes you have to do a wrong or dishonorable thing for a noble reason. I think he's saying that if you find it necessary to do something like this, even if it is for a greater good, you still do not get excused from paying the price for your sin. That's what it means to sacrifice your honor to save the day. You accept the dishonor and the punishment for your deed, necessary though it may be. The Starks and the Night's Watch, and Cold Hands in particular, would seem to fit this theme. Anyway, that's how you get a black sword of the morning. I mean, I don't know, I don't write the books. I just happen to notice that the only times when swords run with morning light, they are Stark swords, and they are usually black. All the Stark sword symbolism is black, essentially, just like the Night's Watch, another group dedicated to ending long nights and bringing the dawn. So, I guess we can say that the Starks have a weird sort of inverted sort of the morning symbolism. The symbolism is there, but it's more black than white. More even star than morning star, perhaps. While the Danes speak of morning and daytime, the Starks are talking about winter's coming, which is more akin to sunset and nighttime, especially when you consider that the winter they are really warning about is the possibility of another long night, which is a long winter. As we know, Night's King was said to be a Stark, which is yet another association with Starks and Darkness. Heck, five out of the six direwolves are called Dark. The Stone of Winterfell and the Stark Throne is called Darkstone. And the Kings of Winter famously sit their thrones in eternal darkness, the symbolic wardens of Hades and the Underworld. You could almost see the Danes and Starks as the two signs of the Azor High legacy coin in Westeros, with the Danes' symbolism suggesting them as being bringers of morning, daytime, and light, and the Starks being directly tied to Night's King, winter, darkness, and the kind of mourning you do for the dead. The Danes named themselves after the white sword that their greatest warriors carry, and the Starks are simply drenched in black sword symbolism. This white sword, black sword dichotomy is actually really clear at the Tower of Joy. Now, you all remember the line about Dawn being as pale as milk glass and alive with light, but take a look at the swords in the hands of Ned's group. Ned's wraiths moved up beside him with shadow swords in hand. They were seven against three. And now it begins, said Sir Arthur Dane, the sword of the morning. He unsheathed Dawn and held it with both hands. The blade was pale as milk glass, alive with light. No, Ned said, with sadness in his voice. Now it ends. Now it begins, a statement of daytime and dawn. Now it ends, a statement of nighttime and sunset. The man who likes to say winter is coming might as well have said night is coming, like, F you, Mr. Sword of the Morning mixed sunshine pants. Winter is coming. Now it ends. Life is pain. You'll also notice Ned's voice is filled with sadness here. It's a great example of Ned and John always having to do things they hate and being sad, morose, melancholy, and, yes, mournful about it. Of course, as always, 
everything is inverted. And even though we see these clear daytime and beginning themes with Arthur Dane, and the exact opposite with Mr. Now It Ends and his gray wraiths, we know that the black-clad Night's Watch are fighting to bring the dawn, and the white shadow others are the ones who think the long night is super awesome and fun. The Tower of Joy is a seven-layer cake of symbolism, is what I'm saying, and also, George R. R. Martin likes paradoxes. Still, we know enough to figure out what's going on here at this point. King's guard symbolize others, time and time again, and here at the Tower of Joy they guard an ice moon queen with an icy white sword, and of course the King's guard are themselves white swords from the White Sword Tower. So what about those gray wraiths with shadow swords who stand at Ned's side? Well, we've seen that shadow sword term applied to the sword of the shadow baby that killed Renly, which is implied as a representation of Lightbringer when it's described as the shadow of a sword that wasn't there, meaning Stannis' Lightbringer. This would imply Ned's wraiths as being similar to the shadow babies wielding dark Lightbringers, which doesn't appear to make sense, except when we remember that the Night's Watch are also black shadows with black swords who symbolically parallel the shadow babies. This is really important, so we'll do a quick review of the language here. Now, in addition to this common black sword and black shadow symbolism, the Night's Watch brothers and the Shadow Babies are both symbols of burning black meteors. Now, there are a couple of quotes from fiery weirwood goddesses that make this comparison even more plain. First, the ghost of High Heart dreams of the Shadow Baby that murdered Renly, saying, I dreamt I saw a shadow with a burning heart. And then, la- oh, I'm sorry. I dreamt I saw a shadow with a burning heart. And then later Melisandre speaks of the type of men who can battle the others, saying that they need true men whose hearts are fire. Those would be the black brothers that she is alluding to, men who are black shadows, but who need burning hearts. Even better if they have actual burning hearts like fire whites. Therefore, we can see Ned's gray wraiths with their shadow swords as stand-ins for the Night's Watch. Which makes sense, because after all, standing opposite Ned's crew are three Kingsguard, who seem basically designed to symbolize the others. This is simply another version of the classic Long Night Showdown, and of course the Stark and Winterfell would be leading the watch. As a matter of fact, we've actually seen the Shadow Sword term applied directly to Ned's ice, when Theon thinks about the long steel shadow of his greatsword always lying between them and perhaps even when Oathkeeper becomes a gray blur in Brienne's hands. Ned's sword is called Smoke Dark, and of course the smoke of the Long Night is what shadowed the land, so that sort of implies Ned's sword and Valyrian steel as shadow swords. And at the end of the day, we can basically say that the Night's Watch and the Shadow Babies are also symbolically equivalent to Valyrian steel swords. They all share the same black sword, black shadow, and black meteor symbolism, and all three of those things sort of allude to the possibility of fire. This, to me, is exactly the context in which we should see Ned's gray wraiths at the Tower of Joy. Ned is essentially leading the watch against the others to steal an other baby and a big white ice sword. In any case, I say that Stark and Dane could almost represent the light and darkness of the Azor High archetype, because, true to the yin-yang message about each side containing an aspect of its opposite, the bright white daytime associations of the Danes are marred by the likes of the dastardly Darkstar Dane, who claims to be of the night, and Vorian Dane, who was called the Sword of the Evening. I know, I know, just when it all seemed so clear, so black and white. And as I'm fond of pointing out, Vorian Dane, the Evening Sword, was actually sent to the Wall to join the Watch by Nymeria when she conquered Dorne. That sure sounds like an important War for the Dawn Echo. It seems like a depiction of Azor Ahai, an evil Dane, so to speak, being sent to the Wall to become the Night's King, or maybe the last hero, either one. Although it's not said that Vorian Dane carried Dawn, think about it. He's called the greatest knight in all of Dorne, and he's also the last king of the Torrentine, because the Danes styled themselves as kings before Nymeria came. So here we have the greatest knight in Dorne, and he's a King Dane? Of course he wielded Dawn. And for what it's worth, Aziz from History of Westeros agrees that this seems likely to be the case. And if that's true, Vorian Dane would be like a Night's King Evenstar figure wielding Dawn, which would be pretty cool. Obviously, if Vorian Dane did wield Dawn, he wouldn't have brought it with him to the Wall, but the original event that Vorian may be echoing 
probably would have involved Dawn or some other magic sword going north. Now check out the crew that went to the wall with Vorian Dane. Yorick Ironwood, Garrison Fowler, Lucifer Dryland, Benedict Blackmont, and Albin Manwitty. Yorick is a name primarily associated with a skull in Hamlet, and Ironwood trees are black trees. House Blackmont gave us the Vulture King, and they are rumored skin changers and baby stealers. And Lucifer Dryland is not only named Lucifer, he's also King of the Brimstone and Lord of Hellgate Hall and the last of his line. Then we have House Manwoody, which is a complex metaphor for a dead green seer going into a weirwood. Let me explain. House Manwoody hails from Kingsgrave, and they emblazon their arms with a crowned skull on a black field, and call themselves Manwood. Now, were, as in werewolf, means man, so a weirwood can be thought of as a man tree, and obviously they are man trees. They are the graves of green seers, who are the kings in the grave. So, House Manwoody, Kingsgrave, see how that works. Now, quick shout out to the members of House Man Woody from a podcast device and fire, if any of you guys are listening. Long time fan, long time fan. Point being, this crew is headed to the Night's Watch, Lucifer Dryland, and the Sword of the Evening Dane, and a dead green seer, plus a house known for sinister skin-changing practices. Almost all of these houses have sigils or symbolism which implies the color black. So, these guys would make excellent green zombie Night's Watch brothers. Or perhaps we can see all six of these people as having redundant Night's King symbolism. I mean, you don't send guys like Lucifer somebody and somebody somebody sort of the evening to the wall without grabbing our attention, that's for sure. Finally, wrapping up the thread of Night-associated evil Danes, there's a Samwell Starfire Dane who sacks and burns Old Town. Given Old Town's white lighthouse tower sigil and We Light the Way house words, You can interpret Samwell Starfire Dane as an evil Dane type who is not a fan of lighting the way unless it's with a bonfire of destruction. Old Town also represents the flame of knowledge and learning, and burning it is tantamount to extinguishing those things. Of course, we can't hear the name Samwell without thinking of our beloved Samwell Tarly, and though his battle prowess probably doesn't compare well to his Dane namesake, Sam is nevertheless a Night's Watch brother who slays others with dragonglass, who slays whites with fire, and who smuggles other babies through the night fort. Now we know all Night's Watchmen can symbolize fiery black meteors, so even the Starfire moniker does fit Sam Tarly in a symbolic sense. In other words, Samwell is a rescuer figure and a rescuer name, and so Samwell Starfire Dane can be seen as a Dane with a rescuer name. And that's noteworthy, because one idea that we have is the person that rescues the Night's Queen baby could be a Dane. Also noteworthy is the fact that both Samwells go to Old Town. Is this foreshadowing that Sam will set some part of Old Town on fire? The library, perhaps, after stealing all the old books? Maybe George will do a Library of Alexandria thing. More likely, I would say that Euron will be the one setting things on fire while Sam Tarley is there doing something heroic, like rescuing books. More to the point of highlighting the streak of Danes associated with night and darkness, Samwell Dane shares a name with a Night's Watch brother, which conveys black sword and black shadow symbolism onto Sam the Starfire, and makes him very comparable to Vorian Dane, the Sword of the Evening, who actually joined the Night's Watch, I guess so he could be a true Sword of the Evening until his dying day. So, Samwell Dane, Vorian Sword of the Evening Dane, and Darkstar Dane all living in the shadow of the Palestone sword, you might say. Similarly, the Stark symbolism is not completely one-sided either. Even though the Night's King is said by Old Nan to be a Stark, most people think the last hero was a Stark too, as we just discussed. And even according to the classic legend, Brandon the Breaker Stark was one of the men who ended the rule of Night's King, which according to my theory would be akin to ending the Long Night. If Dawn really was the original Ice... This Stark last hero may have carried it. All that business about the Starks being concerned with the others in the Long Night implies that they want to bring the day, despite their black sword and dark symbolism. Just as the ostensibly day-associated Danes produce the occasional Dark Star or Sword of the Evening, the Starks confound their association with Night's King, Darkness, and Winter by producing the offshoot house Karstark, who are called White Star Wolves due to their white sunburst on black sigil. That reminds us of the bright white star in the hilt of the Sword of the Morning constellation, another daytime association. That white sunburst sigil is also called the Sun of Winter, 
which sounds something like a light in the darkness type of thing, or perhaps a sun that's gone underground to the cave of night, as it is said in one of John's wolf dreams. There's also a somewhat misnamed king in the north named Edwin the Spring King Stark, which is great because Edwin is an Eddard variant and thus an Eldric variant. Then we see expressions of both sides of a dichotomy, with people like Benjen the Sweet and Benjen the Bitter, or Brandon the Shipwright, who liked to build ships, and Brandon the Burner, who liked to burn them. Most importantly, the Stark swords are the only ones who get the morning light symbolism, even though all of their sword symbolism is black. In that, they are like the Night's Watch, who are similarly dedicated to bringing the dawn, even though they fight with black weapons. You guys get the point by now. So, the way to look at the situation, like I was saying, is to think of Stark and Dane as the two sides of the coin that is the Westerosi legacy of Azor Ahai. Both houses manifest both sides of the light and dark, morning star, even star dichotomy, even if each house generally favors one side more than the other. That, I think, is why both houses are showing us this eldritch symbolism, and why both are showing us sword of the morning symbolism. After all, the morning star and the even star have opposite behavior, one rising in the morning and the other one falling in the evening, but really, they are just the same star, Venus, alternating between two different positions every 200 and some odd days. These connections between Stark and Dane also get us closer to understanding how it was that Dawn could have once been the original ice of House Stark and yet ended up in the hands of House Dane after the long night. We first started discussing this idea in Moons of Ice and Fire 2, Dawn of the Others, when we began looking at Ned bringing Dawn to Starfall after defeating Arthur Dane at the Tower of Joy as an echo of the past, when the King of Winter brought his white sword down to Starfall after the long night and left it there for some reason that we haven't guessed. Since then, we've done more research and opened up some interesting possibilities regarding the various potential origins for Dawn, but regardless of where and how Dawn was originally forged, I'm still convinced of two basic truths. Dawn is in some sense the original ice of House Stark, and we are supposed to look at a Stark delivering Dawn to Starfall as an important historical echo. However, I'm not happy leaving it there, and as we discussed a moment ago, the telling of the last hero story seems to imply that he acquired his Dragonsteel sword in the north, which opens up the possibility that Dawn is that Dragonsteel sword, and that it may actually have a northern icy origin, as the symbolism implies. This would explain why a Stark King of Winter figure would have it to bring south in the first place. Given that the King's Guard at the Tower of Joy can symbolize others, and are in service to a Knight's King figure in Rhaegar, and guarding a Knight's Queen figure in Lyanna, and given that Ned's Shadow Sword armed wraiths seem to represent the Knight's Watch, I find that I cannot see this Tower of Joy scene as anything other than a heroic Ned leading the Watch against the others to steal an other baby and their big white sword. If you think about it, that might be one of the very best clues around for a northern origin for Dawn. Ned claims it from the same place that he claims his Night's Queen baby. Personally, I would really like the idea of the original Night's King armed with Dawn, which used to be called Ice. Think again of Vorian Dane, the Sword of the Evening, who may have wielded Dawn and who was sent to the Wall. And think again of Darkstar, who really seems like he's about to steal or claim Dawn. Here's the important description of Darkstar from an Arion chapter of A Feast for Crows. And I know you guys have heard this description before, but after everything we've looked at in the Moons of Ice and Fire series, I think this description will read a little bit differently, so take a look. I shall remain Darkstar, I think. At least it is mine own. He unsheathed his longsword, sat upon the lip of the dry well, and began to hone the blade with an oilstone. Ariane watched him warily. He is high-born enough to make a worthy consort, she thought. Father would question my good sense, but our children would be as beautiful as dragon lords. If there was a handsomer man in Dawn, she did not know him. Sir Gerald Dane had an aquiline nose, high cheekbones, a strong jaw. He kept his face clean-shaven, but his thick hair fell to his collar like a silver glacier, divided by a streak of midnight black. He has a cruel mouth, though, and a crueler tongue. His eyes seemed black as he sat outlined against the dying sun, sharpening his steel, but she had looked at them from a closer vantage, and she knew that they were purple, dark purple, dark and angry. 
His hair fell like a silver glacier, divided by a streak of midnight black. Folks, if the dragon locked in ice could be hair, well, this is what it would look like. A streak of darkness locked in a silver glacier. A falling silver glacier, we should not fail to note, as that's an ice moon disaster prophecy. And placing dark star in front of a dying sun makes him a moon in the God's Eye Eclipse position. But of course, he'd be the ice moon. So again, this is prophesying that the ice moon will do the whole God's Eye Eclipse moon breaking thing, the same as the fire moon did. I also can't help notice that Dark Star, who also stands half in starlight and half in shadow in this chapter, is sitting there honing his sword with an oil stone, which makes us think of oily black stone and black meteor swords. So, here is a dark-eyed, dragonlord-looking dude, but he's an even star figure who was of the night, with dragon-locked in ice symbolism in his hair. Sure seems like a Night's King type to me. And for those who like puns, there does seem to be a running hair air pun, and that's H-A-I-R versus H-E-I-R. And this pun features prominently in Ned using hair color to figure out that Joffrey was not, in fact, Robert's heir. If Dark Star is Night's King, the dragon locked in ice represents his seed and his soul, and his seed would be his heir. And look, right there in his hair, a streak of darkness locked in a silver glacier. It's Dark Star's seed, which would look like a dragon lord, according to Ariane, but of course it would be locked in that glacier. I think I've made my point. And so, if we see Darkstar wielding Dawn, or better yet, if he eventually becomes part of Fagon Blackfire's Kingsguard and puts on the snowy white raiment, he'll be a Night's King figure wielding Dawn, as Vorian Dane may have been, and he'll be fighting alongside his white shadow brothers. I find myself quite attracted to this scenario, and it would really clarify the Tower of Joy symbolism. Ned is indeed claiming both the original ice sword of the Others and the stolen other baby from the Others and the Night's Queen. If Darkstar gets Dawn, we'll just have to wait and see who comes along and takes it from him, and I'd expect that scene to echo the Tower of Joy if it happens. To sort of put a bow on all this black and white, Stark and Dane stuff, I'll simply point out that Martin, the great defiler of tropes, cannot resist giving us example after example of shining white, spotless-looking Kingsguard knights of noble birth, who are in actuality horrible, horrible people. Sander Clegane's vulgar commentary on the honor of knights is actually a stunningly clear indictment of this kind of falsehood. Conversely, George shows us the Night's Watch as an opposite of the Kingsguard, made up of the low-born, the outcasts, and the criminals, wearing cheap and threadbare black rags, and yet possessed of the most important duty in the realm, guarding the realm of men from the others. They aren't all perfect by any means, but men like Lord Commander Mormont, Benjen Stark, Donald Noy, etc., have more honor in their little fingers than anyone we've seen in the Kingsguard. I mean, don't forget, the great Gerald Hightower watched Mad King Ares torture Brandon and Rickard Stark and who knows how many other people, and then afterward lectured Jamie on how they are not there to judge. Similarly, Arthur Dane stood silent and did nothing about Ares' wild violations of the feudal contract. And in the end, he, Gerald Hightower, and Oswell Went were effectively keeping a pregnant and dying Lyanna prisoner in a tower, which is kind of messed up. In my opinion, none of the Kingsguard who served Ares to the end had any honor to speak of. And this is a subject I look forward to uh, climbing on my soapbox about at the next live stream, you can be sure. Now, at the end of the day, the monsters can come in white or black, and in ice or fire. We've got white ice demons and demonic black dragons. And conversely, we have both black and white swords with symbolism that is suggestive of ending the Long Night. The Danes and the Starks seem to be the epicenter of some kind of yin and yang, morning star and even star dichotomy of symbolism, one that appears to define the concept of the sword of the morning and the last hero. And standing there at that crossroads and staring back at us through the mists of centuries and eons is a man named Elderic Shadow Chaser. A special thanks to our dragon patron, Bron Steris, a wise old dragon who riddles with sphinxes. Some say that it was Bron Steris who first uttered the phrase, much and more.
All right, little bonus round for you here. Since we've broken out the Lord of the Rings stuff, the Cimmerillion, really, I suppose I should mention that the tradition of magical black swords is not only strong with the Starks and Targaryens, and with Elric and his friends from Melnibony. That's right. Not only does the Silmarillion give us a white and red flaming sword, wielded by people who sound like Danes, it also has a strong helping of black meteor swords with magical properties. There was actually a pair of black meteor swords, and they sound a damn lot like my theory about Azor Ahai's Dark Lightbringer being a black sword made from the same black meteorite spoken of in the Bloodstone Emperor myth. The two black swords of Tolkien's world were forged by the dark elf Eol, and they were named Anguirel, Iron of the Eternal Star, and Anglicel, Iron of the Flaming Star. That's somewhat reminiscent of Widow's Whale and Oathkeeper, I would think, or perhaps Blackfire and Dark Sister as twin black swords. Like Valerian steel, these black swords were well-nigh unbreakable and could shatter any terrestrial steel swords. Anglicel in particular is worth noting, as it is said to be a sentient sword, much like Eldric of Melnibony's Stormbringer, or like Lightbringer being infused with Nissanissa's soul and spirit. Anglicel, seriously, that's a great name for a metal band, was even reforged and renamed Girthang, which means Iron of Death, and that was used to kill Glaurung, the first and most magical dragon of Tolkien's universe, who, according to Tolkien, sired the rest of dragonkind. The most important wielder of Anglicel, an elf named Turin, became known as Mormigil, the Black Sword of Nargothrond, after Anglicel was reformed and named Girthang. It's named after his own black sword. That sounds familiar. I don't need to tell you that this may be the origin of Barth Blacksword's name, though the Eldric Tales use the black sword term as well. Eol, the dark elf who forged Anglicel and Anguirel, has a sort of familiar family drama going on. He takes an elven wife against custom, sounds like Azor Ahai, taking Nissa Nissa, an elf wife, and then he prevents her and her son Meglin from leaving his wood, which they eventually do anyway, when Meglin was twelve, stealing Anguirel as they left. And that reminds me of the time when Magor the Cruel was about to die, and Queen Reyna fled King's Landing, stealing black fire for her son Jaehaerys to wield. Anyway, Eol's wife and daughter fled to the elven court and were followed by Eol, whom the elven king ended up executing by throwing off the cliffs of Gondolin, but not before he cursed his son Meglin to die the same way. During the same event, Eol also killed his wife, Aridel, when she stepped in front of a throne spear meant for Meglin, which is obviously similar to Azor Ahai killing Nissa Nissa with Lightbringer. Their son, Meglin, like Megor the Cruel, is remembered as being the most evil elf ever, for he alone willingly served Morgoth and eventually betrayed Gondolin. He was indeed thrown from the walls of the city during combat, as the curse promised, and overall I'd say the idea of a cursed black sword comes through pretty strong here. The other black meteor sword, Anglicel, turned Girthang, was involved in a tragic story as well and that one involved a friend stabbing another friend by accident and then committing suicide. Girthang was even said to mourn over the slaying of Beleg at the hand of his friend Turin, making it a black sword of mourning, or a black mourn blade. Again, we have to think of Elric's cursed Stormbringer, and the notion of Lightbringer as an evil black weapon that drinks the blood of those it slays. Ned was even slain by his own black ice sword, which is somewhat reminiscent of Turin being slain by his own black sword, Girthang, though Turin committed suicide and Ned did not. All right, my fine friends, it's time for me to say, now it ends. But only for a little while, as I'll be back in three days with Blood of the Other Four, Eldric Shadow Chaser. Then we'll have our live stream a week after that on Saturday, April 7th, at 3 o'clock Eastern, on the Lucifer Means Lightbringer YouTube channel. So send in your questions, and I'll see you then. 